in Mike Reese's Bible, uh, there's a note on Philippians 3 that apparently I've said this before, uh, that this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Uh, the start of Philippians 3 and um, the conclusion of Philippians 3, which we won't get to all of it this week, uh, mirrors a story of mine that I'm not all that comfortable with, but it's true nonetheless. That I grew up in a, um, in a church of Christ, and, it, uh, and I, I had it all right from a very early age. Um, I had it all together, you know. There I was, 12, not smoking, and, and I, I had done the things that I was supposed to do, and even at 12, 13, I had started sort of start to look at other people and realize that other people weren't doing the things that they were supposed to do. They hadn't done the sorts of things that I had done. They hadn't lived the way that I had lived. And so there was a definite lie about who was actually a Christian and who was not a Christian. And uh, guess who got to do the drawing of said lie? You know what I would say, what I would tell you if you asked me back then um, is, well, God does the drawing of that line, but I don't think that line is necessarily all the time. I think drawn by God. I think we, I think we draw our own. The lines we draw between those who are in and those who are out do more damage than anything. We do. The line we draw and say, well, those people are out and these people are in. We, we are the deciders and we are the judges. That is a very hard way to live. Because what happens when you live that way is when you judge other people, you solidify who you are right there in there. So I am this. And I have made it. And so instead of actually judging other people, what you're doing is you're just defending your belief system. You become, and we talked about this in class last week, you become the, um, the bouncer to the party instead of the one celebrating inside. You're trying to determine who's in, who's out, who's made the right mistake, or the, 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 the right decisions, who's made those really wrong mistakes. Not, the, not the, the, the typical good Christian sense, but like the real bad non-Christian sense. Mm -hmm. Right? And so we're drawing these lines and making these divisions and saying, who's in and who's out? And there's a group of people uh, that in the first century who, had, who were going from town to town and were living in different towns doing just this. And it wasn't necessarily living by a strict code. A lot of was part of it. They were saying, you have to be a Jew to be a follower of Jesus. And so if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to convert to Judaism. Jew following Jesus is a Jewish practice. It's not for the Gentiles or the nations or the everybody else. Anytime you hear the word Gentile in Scripture, it just means everyone else not Jewish. So you have to follow a certain set of rules and you have to make a certain set of decisions to become a Jew and then you have to become uh, a and then you can become a follower of Jesus. These people were called Judaizing Christians. Judaizing Christians. Uh, if someone ever jumps out of a, like behind a tree, say you're just walking in a park, and someone jumps out of a tree and they say, quick! What was the problem in, and then it just picks a city, in the, in the church in this city? Um, you can typically say, in fighting Judaizing Christians or um, pre-Gnostic Christianity. But, one of those three, and you're right. Because what happened was Judaizing Christians were coming in and they were saying, no, you guys, listen, you're eating the wrong foods, you're not celebrating the right holidays, um, you haven't had the appropriate surgeries. Thank you. I didn't want to have to explain that. But Paul does. 
I'll let's explain it. He goes on, the, the first verse is sort of this um, connection. The, he says, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. But watch out for those dogs, those, mute, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision. Okay, a little explanation there. Uh, the, the church... The Judaizing Christians were saying we're, would call themselves the circumcision uh, you know, uh, for obvious reasons. And they would call them, the other people the uncircumcision, uh, the, the uncircumcised people. So he said, we are, for it is we who are so the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. And then he adds this, though I myself have all sorts of reasons to put confidence in the flesh. He goes on, he says, if anyone thinks they have more, um, they have uh, reason to put confidence in the flesh, or more reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day, which is just what you did with good kids, you know. Um, I was circumcised on the eighth day, which, which is funny to me, that's the eighth day of his life. Good job, Paul. Right, like, that's not really on a mark for you. That's a mark for you. But anyway, I was circumcised on the eighth day. The people of Israel, the tribe of Israel, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. As for legalistic righteousness, or righteousness when it comes to the law, I was faultless. You want to get into a battle of, of how many times you went to church. If you want to get into a battle about how many times you didn't go to parties. If you want to get into a battle about how regularly you how, how well you knew your Bible. If you want to get into a battle of all those things. Paul says, I've got you beat. Paul says, I lived that life. That life that asked of me to follow every single rule or God is going to be mad at me. I followed the life where I had to get everything exactly right and God or God was going to be uh, upset or God was not going to like me or love me or save me or redeem me. God was watching. See, I lived that life and if you think you can do, Paul says, I, if you think you can do better than me, you, you, you got something else coming. But, Whatever was to my profit. Whatever was to my profit. Whatever gains to me, I now, or whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, now notice he's not saying I lost like a big business. I gave away my big business. Or, I had a lot of money and I gave away a lot of money. Um, he's saying I was respected because of my deeds and my, um, my uh, zeal for following the law of God. He said, but I consider all of that. Whatever we're gaining to me, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ's blood is more. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Problem. Whenever I was younger, and it still is a problem to a certain extent, is I feel very good about the things I know about God. Um, I feel pretty confident in that. You know, like you, you study your Bible enough and you start thinking, yeah, I, I know more about God today than I did last week and, I'm, and it's gaining. Randy Harris, who's a, a professor at Abilene University, said, uh, once told a group of preachers of whom I was uh, part of, they said, hey, I, um, if you aren't the smartest person in your church about your Bible, you better be gauging on whoever it is. 
you've got the time. Study harder. So you study hard as a preacher or as a Christian or a minister or just a labor, someone who just loves their Bible. You study hard and you start feeling pretty good about what you know. Paul saying, I knew it all. Paul, Paul probably could speak three, probably five different languages and dialects. He's an extremely smart man. Extremely well He knew his Old Testament better than anybody. He lived it out. He followed the rules. Not only do I know the rules, he said, but I follow the rules. Then he makes this line, draws this line and says, but all of that is worthless compared to knowing Christ. The, problem, the biggest problem I have in my Christian wall is overvaluing knowing about God and undervaluing knowing God. Knowing. So there's a difference between I know them and I know them. Someone you know has lost a loved one and they sit down on, they're sitting down on that front pew in the, in the, uh, in the, the visitation. Which visitations are just so hard. You know, it's essentially like, uh, like the old reception line for weddings, just the reverse of that. It's the saddest reception line ever. People, you, as um, someone who uh, is, as the person who has lost someone, it feels like by the end of the night that you're just having to comfort everyone else. So you're sitting down there at the end of one of those visitations, and you're sitting on that front pew, someone comes and sits beside you and says, your favorite color is red. love Italian food. You once danced the Macarena at the Rangers game. You probably turn to that person and say, what? What do you do? They would say, I, I want you to know that I know you're here. Well, if you really knew me, you'd want, you would be quiet right Because there's a difference between knowing about somebody and knowing somebody. And one doesn't produce the other. I've used this analogy before, but whenever I started um, dating Rachel, uh, there was there was really a, it was like a contest to see who would have my hand and I pick her. <laughs> and no, we connected, uh, we, we went to the same church camp, and we grew up uh, knowing of each other. And then um, I was standing watching a uh, uh, basketball game, and she spotted me. This is the truth. I am not lying to you about this. <laughs> she spotted me and um, tripped over a couple of friends getting to me. She said, hi. She wanted my, and this is, you know, kind of dates me. She wanted my AOL instant. Username. <laughs> uh, so we so we chatted a little bit. But if I would have confused the idea of knowing about her and knowing her, I would have gone about it in two different times. So knowing Rachel meant spending time with Rachel and talking and listening um, amongst the silence. Knowing about her would have just been this information die into, like, I would have stolen her diary, which she didn't have one, and if she had one, I would have stolen it, I would have dug her trash, I would have followed her and watched her and really paid attention to what she did. See, I think sometimes we think we've entered into a relationship with God, but all we're doing is stalking. We're just gathering information and not gathering any intimacy. 
we are not going to pass a quiz to get into the kingdom of God. What does Jesus say in every parable he tells in which there are people who are in, let into the celebration and people who are out? People who are in the house and people who are on the streets. People who can attend the wedding and aren't able, allowed to attend the wedding. I don't know you. Paul says, I consider all of that mess. Here, garbage, I think garbage is the word used here for the word scubula, the Greek word scubula. There is not an appropriate word I can say from the pulpit to properly translate the word scubula. Um, it would have like a dollar sign at the beginning and like an at symbol in the middle. It's not a good word. It's a Greek slang word. And he can say garbage is a decent enough. Rubbish is actually probably better. Waste. It's, I consider it all worthless. Is there all that because I want to know Christ. We're going to get into what that means and how that um, meshes um, even further next week. But I don't want you to confuse knowing about God with knowing God through Jesus. Being in relationship with. I have, um, I have over 1,200 friends I think. Right? I get a medal or something. I have way more than I should. What happens is I go and I'll speak at like a youth rally. And the first thing all these kids do is find me on Facebook and ask me to be their friend. And I can't go to these youth rallies and be like, hey, God loves you, I love you. Um, let's, let, you live, let's follow Jesus together and push people to do that. And then, then they come and be like, hey, can we, can we be friends? No. You know, I can't, so I accept them. I know nothing about these people. And on a regular basis, I will, I will open up Facebook and there will be something. Who is this person? Where are they even? I, don't, I can't even tell you where they're from or how I'm supposed to know them. But we're friends. What's crazy is because we're friends on Facebook, I can click the About section, you know, and find out when their birthday is. Some of them are stupid. Their social security number is there. And, like where they were born. And who they're in a relationship with. What, what emoji expresses their emotions the best at the moment. I can find out all sorts of information about them. And still not know them. I can know about a lot of people. You only know a few. We are called not just to know about God, not just to know God, but to be known by God. And in the end, that's what prayer is and does. It allows us to come into the presence of God. You don't confess your sins before God because God doesn't know. You confess your sins before God because you trust God with that. And you are in a relationship with this creator, the savior that you trust. He says, he says, all of this stuff I was good at is worthless. All of this stuff that I thought was um, going to gain me something, it is worth it. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes to us only because we believe that Jesus can do what Jesus says he did. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining 
to the resurrection of the dead. Knowing about God is real easy. And I want you to hear me real clear right now. I'm not saying that there are some people who know about God and there's some people who know God. I think it's actually probably a good chance that most of us, part of us at times, know about God and we're not really in a relationship with God. And then sometimes we are. And that, that the line between knowing God and knowing about, just knowing about God, is sort of divides us down the middle. So we're not separating different groups of people. We're just saying this sort of, this tension exists in us. Where we think we can get by with saying, well, I know that God would, I know what God wants. I know God's rules. I know this, I know this, uh, God wants this, or God, God did this, or this is the way God saves us. And we can know about God all day long. Doing the things Jesus did is exhausting. <clears throat> Loving the way Jesus loved will wear you out. Forgiving the way Jesus forgives, stepping in the steps that Jesus stepped will wear you out. Being right about all the rules will only inflate you. Thy head. That's, it's not as beneficial. Paul said, oh, that's all that old ways. Ways. I want to know him. Like, know it not just in the good and um, good times, but bad times. Like, I want to share in his suffering. I want to be there with him. That's what someone you know does for you is they share in your suffering and they celebrate in your moments of joy and your moments of redemption. And so somehow I too will take the resurrection of that I want to be a church that knows Jesus and is known by We should be sick of trying to be, and we don't really do this, but churches should be tired of trying to get everything right. Because if you got everything right, you really wouldn't need the one who did. We are going to fall imperfectly into the arms of the Savior who knows us and is known by the Savior whom we know and we are known by. We are seeking a relationship with this God. A relationship with this Jesus. And that relationship will affect every other relationship around you. Good relationships do that. Benjamin, the other stuff is important. Paul's, Paul's, okay, yeah. Paul's not saying I consider all those things scuba love. Period. He said, but compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, Then, it's like this, I love fried chicken. I do. Rachel makes good, uh, Rachel makes good everything, but there, when she, sometimes she makes fried chicken, and it's good too. <coughs> I love that. Like, I, I, I could eat, it's crazy because I couldn't eat that until I'm dead. <laughs> Not just full, like I stop breathing. <laughs> but if you make me choose, obviously, between fried chicken and my children, right? I mean, not saying one's bad and one's good. You're saying one's of worth and 
one is in balance. And that the focusing on one will ruin you. And the focusing on the other practical stuff. You don't want to just say, hey, go get a relationship with Jesus, like we well, read in the letter. A um, couple of things. Um, spend time in, just pick a mark, right? Take five minutes this week. Notice I didn't say five minutes a day. Five minutes this week. Come on. You can do it. Five minutes this week. And just read a story about Jesus. That's it. Just do it. Just read a story about Jesus. And don't think, well, what does this tell us about God? And what can we know about God? Because just read a story about Jesus and think. Just think about it. Just let it sit in your brain for a little bit. Have experiences of Jesus from the Bible. You don't have to come up with doctrine. Actually, I would argue, try not to come up with doctrine, with theology. Jesus healed this leprous guy. And I get to watch it. I get to be present while it happened. And imagine it happened. And then all day, you don't even have to have the Bible in front of you. Just sort of replay that scene in your head. And then secondly, uh, spend some time in those weird, silent moments of your day. <coughs> Let them be silent. You know, when you're driving, um, turn off Taylor Swift and just be aware for a second that God is present with you. That you love. You don't have to say anything. This isn't, I mean, yes, you will pray, and that may happen, and that may just. But just the fact that God is present, and you and God can handle the silence together, and build that relationship. That allows you to start thinking, like, uh, well, I'm. I don't have to say all the right things to be in the presence of God. I can just be in the presence of God because God loves me enough to be present with Him. Just exist in the presence of God. The way I've always said to do this, and if this doesn't help you, then you can throw it away. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily a binding thing. But I, you wake up, you say a prayer, don't say amen, just let it ride. I've started my day. And sometimes it's quickly, you know, just um, our Father who is heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then I go get my daily bread. Then I go be present with people, and there's a sense of I'm open to the conversation with God. I think we say amen too much in our prayers. Let it sit. Let it be open. Be present with God. And at the end of the day, acknowledge that God was present throughout the day. Sometimes you'll forget. I promise you, but first off, you'll start, you'll say, well, I'm going to try that. I'm going to, and you'll start and you'll forget it. God loves you anyway. Do it again. You didn't fail him. That sort of relationship with God can get you through very great times, very difficult times. So I'll be honest, my understanding of the book of Acts has rarely helped me whenever I'm very sad. The presence of God has. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, has a relationship with the Redeemer.
have. It's helped more than I could ever even account for. So this week, whether it's need, you need to start it today, or you need to continue it and you need our prayers as you go out the door, focus on building your relationship with God. Not some database about God, but your relationship with God. And just be present with the Savior. That will matter more to you than I can ever explain to you from this elevated stage. Seek to know Him. Those who seek will find it. And those who knock, the door will be open. If you want to seek, if you want to knock, then please come forward. I'm here the Savior's name.